I have just had my second conversation with my second guest in this, or guest conversation partner in the series of, of conversations. Frank Ebert, also American. I met him in the Story Skills Workshop, which is an akimbo workshop. And I really like Frank. We had a, a Zoom call a while back, and I wanted more, so I asked him if he wanted to be one of my conversation partners, and he said yes. So, you are about to hear this conversation And we meander over plenty an area. We talk about finding those places, those spaces, those settings or contexts that nourish you. Being able to find them making sure to hang on to them and how important that is for a life well lived, really. And then we talk about the importance of language. We speak about many different words here, about deadline, and judgment versus discernment, about fear. Yeah, there is a lot. And I'm hoping you will enjoy this time with me and Frank as much as I've enjoyed this time with me and Frank. So let's jump right in. How are you? Uh, You know what? I've just been in Writers Club. Oh, yeah. And yeah, with Allison and Zoo. We had some interesting conversations today. And Sue reported on a story that she started a couple of weeks ago when we got to talking about poo. (laughs) And that reminded me that I had a story that I was saying that I would uh, write about poo too. So I've just written a story about poo and published it. (laughs) (laughs) And we're not talking about the little bear, are we? (laughs) No! (laughs) No, not that one. Not P O O H. No, the P O O. Let's be clear. <laughs> yes, <not> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, so well, there you go. So I'm today. kind of. Yeah, well, you know. So I'm kind of on a roll here. Uh, yeah. So anything awkward, embarrassing, no, shameful, good. you know, just good. put it out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's always a fair bit of that going on one way or the other. <laughs> Um, well, I, as I was writing yesterday, I caught myself in a marvelous moment of, of trying to understand the nature of my angst that began in the first days of the Alt MBA Mm -hmm. and really has not let go of me since then. Um, and I, I managed to get a few um, a few moments of calm and insight enough to sketch a note back to you. And that was really an extension of a handwritten note that I'd put in my notebook. The first such journal entry by hand in a notebook in many years, which tells me that I'm in quite a state if I'm reaching for a notebook to actually handwrite in to try to you know, deal with something. Mm-hmm. So, um, one of the things that, that settled in for me as I was growing up and becoming a part of society was this notion that my time wasn't mine. You know, that there's this, where there's this relationship we have to have with money that involves sacrificing our time. And we have to trade off our time in order to exist and we slowly get lowered into that water 
uh, and the temperature slowly comes up as we go from being children to young adults. And that I sort of overcame that by starting my own firm about 20 years ago. Then having children, having to reacquire it again. And over the last four or five years, there's been some settling and COVID was magnificent for me in that respect because everybody else was slowing down in a way that I could acknowledge it. Usually I can't see if my customers are slowing down or speeding up because they're in some building somewhere and I never see them. But COVID, it was clear everyone was in vacation mode for a good while. Mm -hmm. And so I could settle down. And that was the energy that I brought to story skills. And it was magnificent. I just really had this sense of, oh, okay, this is what this emerges into. This is magnificent. This I want to keep going. And Alt-MBA just put all the pressure from when I was in my 20s right back on the pile. <laughs> and I, I'm So I've spent the last two months trying to understand what this is. And why is this happening? Where is this coming from? What is this about? So... It, I actually the that thing that you posted back to me. Yeah. Uh, I actually copied it down. I have it on my phone. I was oh, going to yeah. ask you if if I could read it or if you want to read it because I thought it was so beautiful. Well, uh I think it would be lovely if you did. It would be interesting to hear my words from somebody mm -hmm. else. Okay. So so the preface is we were back and forth Finding a time for this, you were asking about, um, you know, where did the idea of the podcast come from? Yeah. I answered you saying that it was uh, Caspian helping me, as he usually does, to, to get something that he's gotten ages ago. Uh, you know, the penny dropping a little bit slow now and again. Um, and you wrote back. I mention it, your focus, because there is a part of me calling out again for that blessed space beyond the actual demands of others and the call of a dozen projects I want to be working on. I'm taking this morning as a windfall of time to consider the last two months roughly starting with Alt-MBA. I'm noticing that my attention was drawn to the wide range of challenges I face and decisions I have to make, all within a 30-day, 13 assignment time frame with 14 hours per week of group discussion. It wore me out and depleted whatever tankespian I had in place to handle my situation. So I am in a reset, not exactly negative, but not really positive either, wintering. The gentle and the edge is in observing, just observing your productivity and my anxiety, letting my curiosity wander a bit, letting my fears speak so they can know they are heard and don't amplify themselves to get my attention. Then I can start to see what is what. As seems to be the case frequently, I notice nothing has really changed around me. It's just me being drawn into the myopia of deadlines without breeding. Yeah. And that's one of the most lucid things I've written in what seems like weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think over the course of those couple of hours, um, I came to the realization that the that the emotional texture, the emotional currents that came out of story skills is much more in keeping with the way my psychology resonates and works. And the pace of business, the pace of, and I, and I don't associate that with Alt-MBA necessarily. I mean, I'm still in a bit of an evaluation phase around all of that. So I, I don't, I don't cast anything on Alt-MBA. It's just that that, that that stimulus 
from that exercise brought up all of the associations I have about the pace of business, the insistence of business and the relentless demands of it. Um, and, and I felt like, okay, that's the right step towards understanding that whatever it is that I'm choosing to do with my time, whatever it is that is in story skills for me is, is where I need to be, is where I need to go. Um, and so that was lovely and it, and it, and it helps with all the other activities around me because then I can take whatever, you know, the business demands and trim it down and I don't have to, you know, stay in front of the screen and fiddle with decisions that, that aren't really yielding much, uh, either from, for me or for my clients. Um, and at the moment, just sort of step away and, and remember what it's like to breathe. Remember what it's like to have that feeling of, of relaxation again um, around a body of work or around some body of effort. Um, because that's the, that's the challenge for me is that uh, the anxiety ramps up and for me it looks literally like I'm, I've forgotten to breathe. Mm. And then, you know, all the cognitive stuff goes, goes along with it. And it's not, it, it, it's, it's not the presence of high pressure that gets to me because I'm relatively comfortable in many high pressure situations. It's the, uh, it's the purpose piece. It's the feeling that, you know, there's, there's, there's some belief that I have around intentionality. There's some feeling I have around my place in the world that there is something that, that calls me and there's an expression that I want to have in the world. And it's tricky language for me because it, it, it has that self, self-ness, that self-centeredness about it and this you know boomer style version of the pursuit of happiness and it's not what it is it's it's a kind of um it's a little bit more uh it's you know i was made to do something it's it, it's a little more fundamental in its belief that that i have been put here to do something my father once said you know, you could choose to do what you want to do. And then in his way, he elaborated because he would wander aimlessly in conversation. But he said the his version of it was that the, 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 the world needs things done. And so I should be casting my eye on what needs to be done. But not only that, what it is that I want to do out of that list. And so find that intersection between those two things. And so that's a lot of been a lot of my journey. And what story skills revealed to me was, right, I really like working in figurative language around my actual story. You know, it's not, it's not that I want to make fiction. um, Although that is of interest to me. Uh, It's that there's poetry in our days if I can find it, if I will look for it. And, you know, basically, if you look for it, you'll find it, it's everywhere, Mm -hmm. you know. It reminds me, somebody said to me, if I could, you know, shape my dream day. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be lovely. And I said, (laughs) who can do that but you? (laughs) Right, right. Right. And it's like, 
yeah, uh, no one, <laughs> you know? And, and the sense that what she had as her dream life is her life and, and kind of what you're saying, more of her life. Yeah. So less of the, you know, not stop working, right? But but a little bit less, so that there's a little bit perhaps more time with the kids, yeah. and there's a little bit more time for her with yeah. her, you know. That and and I went, you know, it's like a lot of people think that their dream life is, you know, I want to be. Footloose and fancy free, you're single in New York City, and you're you know you're <laughs> stuck with a husband and three kids and and two dogs in the middle of nowhere in Sweden. Right. You know, right. it's like <laughs> right. it ain't gonna happen, right? Right. You know, right. but but her, she just wants more of that which she has, or rather, she wants less of the things that keeps her. Uh, yeah. spinning yeah. on it and, and yeah. you know, not being able to or not having the strength to look for that poetry in a sense. Well, right. And I think that I think that we have this mysterious relationship with the power we actually have um, in our lives. And uh, I, I don't I don't feel like that's something that we make a lot of um, I, th I think we have a I think we have a fraught relationship with understanding what our actual agency is and that and that we have the availability of a lot of stories which tell us we don't have agency we don't have the ability to choose in a day that you know uh, the clock is set by something else or someone else and, um, you know, somebody else's urgency is something we must, ad must adopt and we must go at it. And it's just not true. You know, there is an imperative. There are other imperatives that are, that are at work in that equation, but our language doesn't really account for that. Mm -hmm. The way we talk about our power, our personal power, um, doesn't really show up. It's just not a common conversation. And even in, you know, 12-step recovery, where this is the central issue, you know, what power do you actually have? Mm -hmm. it, it was years before um, I'm sitting around some table and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, wait a minute. You mean, right. Can, can we just talk about it in those terms? Can we just speak about it as, you know, uh, I actually have power? Like the, the first step says we were powerless over our addiction, you know, is the is the way it goes or our, our our alcoholism or whatever the thing that's got you down. And uh, I, I, there would people be people who said, I'm, I'm powerless. And it would take time for me to understand that that was um, wait a minute, you've just abdicated everything. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we're talking about. That's not what we're doing. That's not what recovery means. Recovery means I get the power that I have, and then I get to choose wisely around it. And, you know, this is the this is the this is the ground which which you were pointing out there. Is I want a little less of that out there, just a little bit less, and more of what is mine, mm -hmm. you know. And I think what's fraught about the language is. Is this conversation about self-centeredness? Is this conversation about the pursuit of ha happiness rather than these other, you know, in America, it's the term, it's, it's the term pursuit of happiness, which also just has a terrible reputation because it's about, you know, giggling and laughing and, you know, living footloose and fancy free in New York single, you know, um, and that's not it at all. I, I, I don't think that's what our... And... It is, this is something I heard a couple of years ago. It's like, it's the pursuit. You're not entitled <laughs> to the happiness. No, 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 no. 
You're entitled to chase it. That's exactly it. right. You know, That's it's like, oh, that really, you know, explains everything about the American dream. You know, it's like it's the pursuit. You're allowed the pursuit. <clears throat> and, you know, what's intriguing about that statement is that, right, we're all chasing. Yes. Uh, yeah. And the, and the stopping and the settling down and the just for Pete's sake. <sighs> Let's breathe for a little while. And take stock of this place that I am in right now. Because maybe the place that I'm in right now is full of riches, mm -hmm. but my attention isn't drawn to it. My attention is drawn to the shiny thing down the way. You know? That I'm pursuing. And, that I'm and, pursuing. Yeah, and, and I mean, I've been, <laughs> I've been thinking about this for many years. I'm not sure in a sense, I am living it somewhat, but I'm not sure it's so visible. So, you know, this, we have to go skiing a week and then we have to go, you know, a couple of weeks to Thailand or Florida or wherever you are in the world where you, you know, that, that tropical paradise, a couple of weeks of that, a week or two of skiing or something else. And, and in order to have money for that, you have to work a lot, right? So you work, 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 so that you then really need to get to that tropical island for a three-week <laughs> vacation because you're so fed up, you're so busy, you haven't, you know, you don't eat, sit down and eat dinner with your kids or your hubby or, you know, it's like... Oh, my God. So it's like, okay, but so if you didn't feel like you had to do the tropical island and the skiing, you didn't have to work so much to have money to do that, then you wouldn't get so stressed from having to work so much that you actually wouldn't feel the need to have to go to that tropical island. Go figure. Which is like, oh, yeah. You it's know. a great t-shirt. There's a great t-shirt. There's two ways to get rich. Make more money or want less. Yes. <laughs> yes, precisely, precisely. And it's like, it, you know, I think a lot of people just don't actually think about that. No, we don't. That we're, we're living. So in a sense, that's what it makes me so happy to hear about people who, you know, love their life. Uh, and yeah. they just kind of want to be able to, to treasure more of it, to be able to find a yeah. little bit more of the poetry that they know is there, rather yeah. than this, I want to chase something else. I can't wait to yeah. get away from yeah. this. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, and I'm drawn immediately to that notion of uh, making meaning, right? And that, that um, you know, the tropical vacation or the, you know, that's a meaning that somebody else came up with that, that 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 wandered into my house or wandered into my life and suddenly it became a demand. Yeah. Oh, whoa, 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 back up. You know, yeah. let, let's, let, let's start over. And, you know, in my case, I've got a busted pipe in the basement. You know, that's kind of a dreamy vacation for me. You know, there's something to be done there. I'm an engineer. I make, I make stuff and I fix stuff. So, you know, give me something broken and I'm happy. Um, there are limits to this, but, uh, you know, for the most part, um, that's, that's what it is. And I think I, I feel, I feel like we're in an interesting time with, with the proliferation of ways in which that I can make money. Hmm. And, you know, the track was when I was growing up that, you know, you make a decision at a devastatingly young age for your whole life about what you're going to do. And you better choose wisely. The pressure's really on because that's it. You know, you choose that career, that's it. Changing a career is impossible. But since the internet's come along, I mean, my 12 year old is, is making rings for a living. Um, and, uh, you know, two years ago she was making slime for a living. <laughs> Two years from now, she'll be making Picassos for a living. I don't know what she's going to be doing. Um, but she's getting a real workout in in the 
um, fluidity of this mm. in that uh, it's all made up. You know, there's this, there's this structure that somehow we have bought lots, lock, lock, stock, and barrel uh, that we, we now have a way to, to, to question and to work through. And I have been rereading two of three books and then reading the third book of the Daniel Quinn books that's called Ishmael, the story of B, and then My Ishmael. Have you read them? No, I have not. Well, you should read them. Okay. Um, so <laughs> Ishmael, it's... You know, it's like, it's fascinating books. They speak about the culture that we live in. Mm -hmm. and you live in it, I live in it, and it's yeah. the same culture. Yeah, it really um, is. And in the third book that I read for the first time now, uh, I, I reread the others. I read those mid-90s, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's been a while, but... In the third book, there's a, a, a piece where they speak about safety. Uh, <laughs> how modern man desperately tries to find safety. And the safety we're desperately trying to find, we're trying to find in money. Yes. We're trying that's to right. find it through amassing zeros on our bank accounts. Yeah. Because yeah, that's yeah. safety. Yeah. And and the theory in the book is we I don't want to spoil it, like, but but the theory in the book is that that's not what safety is. That's why no matter how many zeros you have on your bank account, yeah. you might be feeling like shit anyway. Well, because right. That's not what it's about. Right. What safety right. is about is knowing that your tribe has your back. Yes. That's what yes. safety is. Knowing that no matter if I screw up or if I'm, you know, if I do good, I do what I'm supposed to, you know, I have luck hunting or foraging or whatever, or I don't. Yeah. We will take care of each other together. Um, yeah. And and that is just oh yeah. So no wonder we're working our asses off to gather right, all of that right, money. Right, 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 right. Because because our, our tribes are super tiny now. Yeah. Right. And they're it's our too immediate tiny. family. Yeah. It's, they're it's too our tiny. Family. Yeah. 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 And and um and and maybe that's a, that's a more adroit characterization of of the difficulty I feel between the two workshops, two akimbo workshops. Because the pacing of Alt MBA is I have exposure to lots of ideas and lots of people. Um but every week we're who those people are gets changed up. And there's not sufficient time to develop a handful of exchanges. Um, and what I found in story skills was that you know, my, my first week was, oh my God, you know, I brought, I brought my entire kit of anxiety to the whole writing business. And I spent a week on that first assignment and didn't talk to anybody. I didn't read anything. But as soon as, you know, I just got to this point of impatience with myself where it's like, well, there's other things to, like, there's other assignments now. I, I want to get to them. And I just threw it out there. And, and then I realized that it was, I mean, there was, what, 400 of us who were doing this. And, um, I could just drop in on anybody's thought process and start chatting with them about it. And so I did. And that began a different kind of... I had agency of who to pick when. Yeah. And that was something I never... that, that never really developed um, in the Alt-MBA mm -hmm. organically. There had to have been a much stronger intentionality about it for me there than than I, I was able to bring. Mm -hmm. um, but in story skills, I did. And within that first week, there was like this whole collection of people who I was trying to like keep up with. And um, 
uh, then there was people who had posted and they disappeared a little bit. And so I went after and I found them. I'm like, well, are you okay? What's going on? How, you know, where are you at? And, and so over those just three or four weeks of just doing that, a tribe emerged. Yeah. And now I'm, you know, I'm connected and I feel, I feel, um, I feel strongly that there's, um, not, it's, it's weird because it's, because I feel like for lack of a better term and, and, you know, any better terms that come along would be terrific. Um, the, an art, the artistic com community, I found an art, a community where I can talk about my, my artistic intentions, not broad scale, but for today which has always been the always been the alchemy for me is that I need I need a, sh a a small discussion every day because that's that's where the that's where the edge is that's where the that's where the spirit is yeah where I can yeah. like push off yeah. if somebody gives me something to work with then I can push off on that um and I can generate plenty of things to push off on but my problem is that I've generated 15 things and now I have decision to make which one to which which one to push off from and they're all fascinating and they're all developed out of my curiosity and I'm I'm interested in all of them but I'm out of time so having the conversation with somebody about one of them or if they bring me another one that's great mm -hmm. um, as long as I'm able to express I have a place where I have choice about how I show up And it's interesting about time. Yesterday, I was in a mastermind meeting. I have yeah. a, a mastermind group. There's four of us. We've been masterminding since 2013. We know each other inside out. And yeah. they are definitely part of my tribe. I know they have my back, you know, period. Right, right. right. So I was, I was chairing... Uh, yesterday's session, and we always start off with um, with a little check in. Mm -hmm. And one of us was speaking about, uh, you know, her kids and this and that and the other thing. And I said, "Well, you know, time flies." And Inga Lil said, "Uh, uh, time comes." Ooh. Every day, time comes to you. It's a gift. And I just went, oh, uh, geez. <laughs> you know, uh, that, talk about thank you, Spian, right? Okay, let's flip that one, you know, 180 degrees. Just time comes. It doesn't go. It comes. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. Okay, right, right, right. Talk about reframing. Um, Talk about reframing, yeah. So we had a completely different conversation after that, I can tell you. Well, I'll bet you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, and maybe that'll shift ours as well. Um, yeah, and I, th I and again, that's that, I, and that's what I was talking about was like the myopia of deadlines. You know, yeah. is like it's all coming down to a point. It's all going to be like. It, it all comes to here, and it's and that's 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 artificial, you know. It's a it, it's and it, it's all it's all finishing, 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 finishing. Done, done, done. And who wants to finish when the emotional joy is in the doing, right? And you come to that end, and it's over. And uh, I had a conversation with Allison a couple of weeks ago about the world. The word deadline, which I think I had gotten from somebody else in my creative community. But so deadline is a term coined 1860s from yeah. prisons. Oh, God. Which is oh. if prisoners step across that line, they will be shot dead. So I'm going, wait a second. I don't think I want to be that violent to me with oh the words I'm using, right? So it's like, oh, so I was language. tweeting the other week oh, saying, 
I, you know, it's like, I don't want to use deadline anymore. And, and often yeah, yeah. the deadline is the start of something else, right? It's like a chapter <laughs> or it's the birth of, or, you know, so, so it's like, man, that's a word that really, if you start to think about it, it's a word that's not very regenerative, let's put it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, there's not a lot of generosity in that. No. That's absolutely right. That's that's really intriguing. And time comes, right? So this means, you know, this is this is this is challenging our imagination, challenging my imagination to think about what happens afterwards. Yeah. And one of the one of the chapters that I started writing a lot about was um and actually at the beginning of uh, story skills was that the the task of the architect is completed at the beginning of something new. So, you know, the building is built, the the tenant space is rehabilitated, whatever the, whatever the project is. The, the symphony hall is built. Now we can begin to have symphonies. Yes. You know, and uh, it's, it's intriguing. We, we have this sort of lightheartedness in, in the severity of the use of the word deadline. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, it just means the end of the schedule, you know, when we move on to something. But you're right, we never focus on anything else beyond it. And that's no. certainly, again, the myopia. Yeah. You know, the, the, the putting the blinders on, the forgetting that we're an imaginative, generative creature somehow. And this certainly afflicts me all the time, especially when I'm under load or I'm under some some stresses that I'm having a very difficult time seeing beyond. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, there was a, there was a, um, there was a cycle for me where, uh, late nineties, there was a, quite a bit of upheaval in my life. And I was going through a lot of changes and they were changes that were due, but I was, I was, I, I'd been frightened of them. I, and I knew that some sort of change was necessary and would be coming, but I, I didn't know what those changes would, ex would look like. And one of the things we worked on a lot in, in, in the, on the faith side of things, because that's, recovery is a really curious thing because it is foundationally an exercise in building faith when you don't have any. It's, it's, it's foundationally an exercise in building trust uh, when you don't, when you've gotten to the last shred of trust in anything that you had, you know, a bottom, a way to look at a bottom mm -hmm. is that the last little trust that you had evaporates. And now there's nothing but hopelessness. And so I was rebuilding trust and I was building my faith again. And one of the places that I got to was if is was how to handle disappointment. And I had been shopping for a house, I think, some at some point in the late 90s. And um, I would I would come to a location, I'd see a house and I'd be like, well, this is lovely and the deal would fall through and the mantra was there's something better waiting hmm. there's something better and so at each disappointment that was the that was the mantra there's something better waiting the other the other interesting variation on this was that um during that period of time as well i had begun working for another firm it was many cities away and it was uh so I was based in Washington. They were based in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's about an eight hour drive. And the firm was expanding rapidly and I had a position as a national manager. And so I would periodically go down and, um, and for a while, um, in addition to meeting with my boss, I also met with the CEO on a regular basis. And we had these, we had these, I, for lack of a better term, counseling sessions. He was, he was just sort of, um, it was sort of mentoring of, of, of a sort. And I had been nursing this desire for doing sabbaticals, mm. you know, and part of what was in my mind was, you know, maybe the trip to Thailand or wherever, 
but not really. It was just, I wanted to slow down. Instead of doing 2,500 or 2,800 hours a year, <laughs> can we just do 2,000, just 40 hours a week, please? Um, or even more radical, 1,800. You know, can I get 200 hours off, a little over a month off? This is when I tell you that in Sweden, I think the number is 1,600 days, uh, hours. Yeah. Because we, we have basically a five week vacation. Which is when, which is, which is roughly where I got the idea that when I started my firm, it would be 1500 hours a year. Yeah. That was the goal. And he, he asked me, well, what are you going to do with that time? And the first time I heard that was, the, the first time he said it, the way in which I heard it was, what are you going to do for me during that time while you're away, Frank? I'm like, Bill, it's not the point, right? That's that's where my thinking was, and that's what it was. But that wasn't his point. The second time I heard it, it was, and he elaborated on this, that if you don't decide what you're going to do during that time period, then it will just get consumed by things, you know, other things. If your intention is that you'd like a little control over your life, then you might start by having some intentionality about what you're going to be doing with that time. And so that began the long journey that I think is really what's behind the whole akimbo thing, which is reclaiming the power you have, you know, and the intensity, I, I, I think the, the thing around the alt MBAs is very intense, hmm. but it, every day that you're doing something, it's saying you have the power to make this decision. You decide what framing and reframing you need to do. You decide where your constraints are. You know, you decide what your goals are. And I think that that's a, that's a, that's a pretty powerful thing to be uh, pushing around in the world. And I think it's even slightly dangerous from some corners. Probably. You know? um, and so I, I, I think that's the, that, those are the seeds that are being planted and that's the, that's the wintering that's happening is that, that those are coming up and I'm beginning to see things differently. And I think that working with my tribe and my tribe is fundamentally from story skills, you know, the writers group that, that, that we're running and, and, um, you know, the talks that we're having, um, that's keeping, that's feeding that area. That's keeping that current, that's keeping it going. And I, I remember when we were coming close to the end of story skills and I expressed my concern about, you know, what happens after. Is that, you know, that, that soil stops being worked, you know, and the, that garden stops being tended to because it's very difficult for me to tend it by myself. Mm -hmm. um, Which is, it's, I mean, that's one of the interesting things for me, just this kind of figuring out for myself what are those fields for me? Yeah. What's important for yeah. me, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like, where do I find that? <laughs> um because you can kind of, you know, you can set up experimental gardens, you know, which is yeah. great and fun and and but but then it's like which ones are really regenerative for me in the long run, which were great fun. I had some, you know, I learned stuff and I got yeah. some insights and you know, but yeah. but done done deal, no more. Which are the ones where I go, oh, this one. This yes. one has the ability to nourish me on a sort of a longer arc, a longer time frame. Not necessarily yeah. for life. I don't know that. You know, I don't need to know that. But I know I'm not, I'm not done with it yet. There's more <laughs> for me yeah. there. Yeah. I remember the day... when you lit up <laughs> you just 
lit up because you, we, I think we were part of another discussion, but something had, you'd said something along those lines and I'd said the long arc and you just lit up like a Christmas tree. It was so great. Mm -hmm. Um, and I immediately put that up on my, on my board. Mm -hmm. And so that is now a permanent part of, of, of my thinking. And, and I say that as if that day that thinking showed up in my life, but really I've been, I've been working that way since the beginning. And so the things that are continuously regenerative to me includes asking those long arc yeah. kinds of questions. Yeah. And so I am fascinated by things like meteorology oh. because, it, because it's a long arc of things. You and I exist in the exact same um, channel of weather because it starts where I am and it ends up where you are. You know, uh, the coastal waters uh, for me end up in your neck of the woods and bring you the warmth and the water that bring, bring it to me. And there's these grand connections and there are these connections over time. And part of the arc is time. Part of the arc is geography. Part of the arc is um, the improbability of these kinds of conversations. You're in Sweden. I'm in Washington, D.C. We're having this conversation over some, with some gear, you know, mm. it's, mm. Um, you know, this, the, the only time this would have been possible in, for humanity before now would have been you were on a journey, I was on a journey, or, you know, some variation on that, that would have required a great deal of, of angst to undertake. So, yes, long arcs, where are the regenerative pieces? What do you find? How do you know it when you've got it? So in a sense, for me, it is when I get tankespian, you know, where I repeatedly get things to think about, where my brain just goes, wait, what? <laughs> where I have to, you know, it's like when, when there's, so in a sense, there's movement somehow. Oh. Um, Oh, yeah. And 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 I think because the places that are this for me are places where I am helped to learn more about others mm -hmm. and about me. So it's not something I do just for the outside. It's not yeah. something I do just for the inside either. But for me, it's it's in the mix. It's that. Um, those two components kind of form a, a whole. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, I've been... So, after I took um, the Creatives Workshop, which is also an Akimbo Workshop, a couple of us started a creative community, mm -hmm. which is kind of like the same thing, but just, yeah. you know, it's a long arc because there's no deadline. Uh, <laughs> right? We're going to live through this. <laughs> We're, yeah. And, and I started in August of 2020. It's now April 2021. In August of 2020, I started a deep dive into shame. And I've written yeah. about this sort of publicly, but I'm also writing. Right now I'm up to like 85,000 words wow. that I'm sharing in that small community. Yeah. So that serves as that piece of other that I need for the piece of me to get whole. Like yeah. I, 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 People mirror me, people go, oh, geez, or people go, oh, tell me more. People go, oh, my God, I've never asked myself that question. Shit, yeah. you know, which which turns into me and kind of, you know, it's like it, it 
brings up new seeds. It brings a specific type of nourishment for that particular seed to be able to sprout. So it's 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 that back and forthness. Uh, yeah. Of it. Yeah. Yeah, the facilitating other is the is the phrase that I've been given over the years. Um, and it's uh, and it does not seem to be anchored into specific subject matter. No. You know, it's not broken into industrial sectors for investment. You know what I mean? It's like um, or particular sections of the library. No. Uh, and I, I have, think that's also a point of deception. Yeah, right? precisely. And I mean, I have another of my, 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 like, great examples of, of what, what was born on Twitter in 2013. That was the year everything happened. So in 2013, um, I, along with a couple of others, were catalysts for a movement in Sweden called Skolvåren. So school spring, asking why school. And it turned into this, you know, countrywide movement or platform in a sense where we ask this question, why school? You know, just to get people starting to think about it and not yeah. just people from within the school system. But, you know, I i don't work in the school system, but I, you know, I have thoughts and ideas and, and input and I'm a member of society. And isn't that why school? Um, so that was, that was one of those experimental gardens that became a lush one for mm. a couple of years. And then that one was like, okay, we're, kind of done with this garden now but I got three wives out of that so there's four of us and we call ourselves wives um which is kind of like my mastermind group but it's you know it's like it didn't start off as a mastermind group but it is yeah. just that the conversations we can have you know we all met each other first through our interest in the question of why school mm-hmm but man, can we talk about everything? Well, right. You know, right. so it's like, right. it's, it's, it's life. It's not yes. school. It's not yes. learning. It's life. It's everything. So. Right, 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 right. So and something I, can spring from a specific thing. But if you're like, you know, because these three people, they are amazing. You know, so so with that openness comes this willingness to, okay, let's dive into this other question or issue or article or book or, you know, problem. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, it's such a treat to be a yeah. part of these types of communities or groups or tribes. Um, right. Right, 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 right. And that's, that I think is, is um, the thing that I've been hungry for because I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not an academic um, and not necessarily an intellectual, um, but I have got a very active mind and a very active imagination and a very curious soul. And um, I am a kind of adventurer uh, that, you know, my times of difficulty are around not adventuring, <laughs> you know, uh, for whatever the narrative is, for whatever the reasoning is, I'm not doing those things. Mm -hmm. I'm not diving into that book. I'm not, you know, having this robust conversation with the handful of people in my world who, um, who, <laughs> You know, when I mention the title of a book, they're like, what? Tell me more, you know, or they mention the title of a book. I'm like, well, let me get some popcorn and you can tell me all about it because I want to know. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is it? it, it it's almost as if uh, 
I react to the, the enthusiasm that is generated, you know? So it's, it's, I, I'm at least as interested in your enthusiasm mm. as I might be in the material that we're talking about. Mm. Um, because that's, uh, that really, I mean, talk about bringing meaning. And I think that's the other thing about the meaning and the purpose pieces is that, you know, the, 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 the scope of what we're talking about when, when, when the subject of, well, I have purpose in my life or, you know, I, I made meaning from something. What's the scope of this that we're talking about? And it's, it's so wildly unuseful to have the conversation around these things because the scope isn't defined. And talk about a treat. I just got to say that your enthusiasm for something intrigues me as much often as the subject that we might be talking about. And that's meaningful to me. Hmm. And I've never heard that. I've never heard anybody say, yeah, your enthusiasm is, is, is amazing. You know, um, and that just seems to like flip the whole thing on its end, right? Now I'm reframing again, where is that regenerative thing? But, but in, you know, it's interesting. Somebody, one of my colleagues from last year, we were in a project together. He sent me an email uh, and he started off saying, hi, you know, I hope everything is okay. And then sort of parenthesis, well, I'm speaking to Elena, of course it's okay. With you, it's always okay. You know, it's always great, you know, end parenthesis. And, and then he continued on. He was like, yeah, you know, it is. That's one of the, in, in, 2015, I think I had that epiphany that my life is always just wonderful. Yeah. No matter the circumstances. Like yes. I can feel this drive. Yes. Even if at the same time I'm actually also down or troubled or, you know, have yes. problems with yes. spouses or separations or divorces <laughs> yes. or yes. kids yes. or school or, you know, yes. it's like at the core, it's like, well, I'm still here, right? <laughs> it's like, you can't, you can't get to that part. Um, right. And, and, and congratulations. I mean, first of all, congratulations. I mean, that's, that's, that's no small thing. That's no small accomplishment. Because the, to me, it's, it's, it's uh, sort of the pinnacle of trust. Mm. Bill Wilson would say, would, say, would somehow uh, characterize the, the corners, the, 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 the essential issue for the alcoholic is, is, is not being able to trust themselves to do something very basic that everybody else seems to be able to do, which is to control their consumption of something. And that is vital to basic life. Mm. And if I can't trust that, then I'm a little off the rails. So it meant for him in his language, in his world, that, there, that it required a spiritual solution. And spiritual solution eventually grows into this thing of belief. You know, the word faith, trust, belief, they're all related to, you know, um, um, knowledge without evidence, you know, and that at the end of it, the, the, the core expression of trust is all is well, mm. which is what you just expressed. Yeah. You know, all is well. And yeah, I've had many, 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 many of those moments all the way along. And where I get most bogged down and most disabled is when I forget all oh, as well. Um, because that's, ex you're, you're exactly right. Um, I, we, were, we were on vacation and my, my daughter got into a really difficult position and 
even in that moment, I remembered the, I could find the joy back and forth between you know, she's crumpled on the ground and she's in real distress. And, you know, I'm able to hold her and embrace her when she would let me get close to her. Um, but then I remember the temperature because it was summertime and it was a northern latitude and it was late at night, uh, but the sun was still up. And, and then later there was some other people involved in that experience. And I remember all the details of that and um, marveling at bits and pieces. And those were all things that I would reflect on later as I was telling the stories about what had happened, because there were a variety of people and a variety of needs that I had to tell that story again and again. And, but it was very much like you described despite the distress of the time, despite the distress of the moment, there was the ability for me to find the poetry and yeah. the, the expansiveness and the generativeness of life there. Mm -hmm. There's a marvelous, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if part of the, the value of the conversation by way of sort of, I feel a little bit like I'm a truck stuck in like really deep muck and <laughs> you've come along with your tow cable and you're like, you know, we're trying to get it out. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of um, one of my favorite little twists of phrase in uh, over the last 12 years or so that insanity comes from um, the root of that is Sanos, which is the mind. And somebody pointed out to me that we don't say um, out sanity. No. We say insanity because we are consumed with the operation of the mind. We are consumed with whatever it is that we're thinking about. Yep. And uh, that's what it is to be insane. <gasps> um. And so this interaction with somebody else, you know, getting to the point where I can interact with somebody else mm -hmm. or interact with something larger in the world besides, you know, mm -hmm. this marvelous machinery here. Mm -hmm. But if the only diet this marvelous machinery has is more of itself, then I'm in deep, deep, deep trouble. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean... There you have stated what has been one of the most pivotal shifts for me in my life is when I stopped, stopped believing that I had to believe every thought I thought. <laughs> you know, oh when I realized, <laughs> wait, I right. don't have to believe because I had harsh inner dialogue was oh, like, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have to believe those fuckers. Yeah. Like, whoa, the shift. <laughs> the shift right. was just enormous. You know, because all of a sudden there was like, well, yeah, you can go on, but I don't have to take it <laughs> as, as truth. <laughs> And I think that's with the insanity. I have a relative who's, uh, you know, bipolar. Um, yeah. And it's, it's all along a scale. Yeah. Like yeah. depression, manic, yeah. right? Those are the opposites. Like those yeah. are at the end. Yeah. All of us are on this scale. Yeah. Some people just go a little bit further to the right and right. to the left. Right. Right. But there's nothing, right. you know, it's like we all have, we all have the ability to go further to the right or further to the left. It's okay. in all of us, I would say. And I think one of the key factors in determining if you do or not is just that 
can I somehow stop myself from believing the thoughts that are slowly like taking me, pushing me, nudging me towards either of those extremes. Uh, And you can then, you know, add on physiology and and hormones and and whatnot, but but in a sense, it's all nudges. Um, Well, that's one of the things that, that, that intrigues me about the language of science and the scientific method Mm -hmm. of, you know, when I'm really stuck, to be able to apply that to my thinking. So, you know, I've got a thought that's persistent and it's just grinding at me and it's got me under, you know, it's healing its way. And to be able to step back, find some little bit of leverage somehow um, through conversation normally um, to step back from it and say, identify that, yes, this is the thought that's that's really got me going, and start developing an experiment to test the validity of this thought and go through the entire experimental process. You know, develop a theory about it, develop an experiment to validate the theory, gather some data, evaluate the data, come to a new conclusion possibly. Mm-hmm. And that's not easy particularly when I get attached to or identify with the thought. Nope. Um, and sometimes I find the, I find rather embarrassing things about the thought. Like, you know, uh, this, you know, I've been, I've been nursing some resentment for uh, some years, but really it began as a theatrical demonstration that I'm in distress because I can't get your attention. Hmm. Well, how embarrassing. You know, because I've been telling this story about how, you know, the injustice of the world around this one item for so long, (laughs) only to come to only to come to understand that it was basically a theatrical move. You know, it was a little bit of hyperbole in the conversation because I didn't feel Mm -hmm. like I was being seen or that I was Mm -hmm. being heard. And, you know, that's that's a little thought that just sort of you know, doesn't become a pearl. It's a, it's a grain of sand that gets irritated enough and does not become a pearl. No, the opposite. <laughs> right, exactly. I don't know what that becomes, but it's not, it's not going on a necklace anywhere. Um, but, but it's yeah. interesting. I was actually, yesterday, somebody, Instagram, I saw something. Uh, what the got... Is it the Gottman Institute? They they do a lot about relationships. Okay. And so it was a, a, a little post about low negativity threshold. And I go, <laughs> well, isn't it good to have a high negativity threshold? Turns out, no. Couples who stay together are the couples who... who deal with those little pieces of sand before they turn into nice. a big problem. Nice, nice, right? nice, nice. So, nice. you know, it's like, oh, well, not that again. Rather than going that over and over and over and over again, and then the 500th time you explode, but you haven't said anything the 499 other times, <laughs> right? So it's like, right. where did that right. come from? Instead, right. when that comes, it's like, you know, ask a, a, a question to see if they meant what you thought they meant, or just point out that, hey, that really didn't sit well with me. Or, you know, finding that in the relationship where you can speak about those little pieces of sand and then, you know, check them out before. Yeah, yeah, Um, yeah, right, exactly, exactly, exactly. And that that is... That is why I'm so, you know, hopeful about about having having run into this community because it's been a while since I've been to the twelve step community on a on a routine basis, where that's exactly what we did all the time. Mm. You know, everything was fodder for conversation. It didn't matter. You know, there was a 
there was a low threshold for interesting speech, you mm-hmm. know? I mean, it was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the presumption of coming together is that uh, uh, in a meeting was that whatever's killing you now, literally, whatever you feel like you're going to use over, and oftentimes it's those little grains of sand, yeah, you know, that are blossoming into, um, yeah, you know, from the outside, perhaps embarrassing stuff, but really, no, this is, you know, being clean. You know, there's this biochemical thing going on around all this, but it was really, it was made clear to me from the beginning that, no, we're talking about, um, we are very much talking about uh, clean thinking, Mm -hmm. you know, and being Mm clear-headed. The word sobriety means clear thinking. It doesn't, you know, there's the biochemical piece of it, but that it's, it's really, you know, sober mind. Mm. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a fair evaluation of, of things. So I think that um, uh, being able to go through and identify, yeah, that, that's not sitting well with me, whatever it is. Precisely. Is... Um, is important is important to get at and and i can i can look back at my past uh, my my last marriage i've been married twice um that that here is actually a point where that insight that i don't have to believe every thought in my mind stopped me from from developing that low negativity threshold interesting because it was like, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I'd get upset about something and then I would go, you know, how does this serve me? Well, it really doesn't serve me. And, and you know, perhaps thinking I'll, I'll speak about this when I'm no longer feeling so upset because generally when I'm upset, chances are conversations will go awry. Um, yeah. So it's like, okay, let's calm down. And then when I was calm, it just seemed like the tiniest little thing. Why would I bother about this thing? So this piece of information, the low negativity threshold, is like it's important to carry to to bother about that little thing, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because that will build a culture in the relationship that have you, in a sense, in movement, right? <laughs> There's that movement again. You, you, are, you are, you know, moving That's right. That's together right. and against each other That's now right. and again, but, you know, speak about it rather than, yeah. okay, fixing yourself. And then yeah. 500 times later coming and say, I really don't like who you are. It's like, but, but wait, I've been like this for a long time now. Why haven't you said anything? It's like, yeah. well. High, high negativity threshold. Yeah. High negativity threshold, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it takes a while to sort of figure out, you know, where's, where's the grain of sand that's going to be yeah. trouble, troubling. And then it takes a while to figure out how to talk about it. Yeah. And uh, I'm reading um, The Art of Possibility. It was one of the books that comes uh, from, from Alt-MBA. Uh, they they include it in Sandra. their package. Uh-huh. Yeah, and that's that's how it was introduced to me, and um, I'm so taken with it. I bought a few copies and and sent sent them around um, because it's such a delightful read on these mm-hmm. on these kinds of subjects. Um, and the rule number six, the whole you know, don't take yourself so goddamn seriously. Um, but what I loved about the way that chapter worked was it got to exactly this. Mm-hmm. You know, it gets it gets to the notion of why would we take ourselves seriously in the first place? And that difference between the measuring self and the central self, you know, and the central self is one that is living, doesn't just believe, but is living in the space of all is well, Mm. you know, and I was here 10 minutes ago. I'll probably be here in 10 minutes from now, or I might not be, who knows, you know, and we just, 
You know, life is full of ambiguities and ambivalence. There's no, there's not a lot of certainty to be had in the world. No. And, you know, this is the other interesting thing about our times is that certainty uh, has become currency, you know, um, and, uh, you know, the jig is up on this because the, because the findings are that, that if we are guaranteed certain outcomes, then we'll just go for them every single time, despite the fact that they are terrible decisions to be made. <laughs> and, and, but if they're... and it's interesting, again, I've been, I have been certain in my life. Boy, have mm -hmm. I been certain. Mm -hmm. I've been like very black and white, very determined. Mm -hmm. And then I've shifted from that. I live much more in, in uncertainty now. Yeah. And a couple, well, quite a few years ago by now, in Jonathan Field's Good Life Project, uh, the podcast, mm. he has an episode with Milton Glaser, who's the designer who did the I Love New York with the Apple Ah, yeah, 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 um, sure, sure. Milton Glaser says, certainty is a closing of the mind. To Absolutely. think anew requires doubt. Yes. Which just is, oh, I love that <laughs> quote. I love that quote. It's like, what am I certain that's of? Right. Well, quite that's, not, that's right. you know, not a lot that's of right. things. I'm not, that's I right. can be certain kind of for now. Right. Yeah. But but not yeah. attached to the fact that what I'm certain about now needs to be the same tomorrow. No, absolutely fine. Tomorrow can be something right. else. But right now, yeah. this. Um, right. Right. And it's interesting because it brings to mind that faith. Right. A version of faith is certainty. <laughs> and so maybe what comes of this combination of these two ideas is that is that faith is an object to be held with a certain gingerness, you know? You need to sort of like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that faith and doubt mm -hmm. belong to each other. Yeah. And I think I've I've heard this in 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 uh theolo from theologians who yeah. who are much more grounded. Yeah. You know, that that the faithful um are skeptical. Yeah. The faithful do have doubts. Yeah. I mean, look at Judaism. Is that how you say it? Um, <laughs> Judaism. Judaism. You know, it's like, well, can they question? Yeah. Sure. You know, which is sure. that entire thing. It's like it sure. needs to be questioned constantly, constantly, yes. constantly, right? Yes. Yes. Um, and the Jesuits is, and the Jesuits as well in the in the, in the Catholic tradition. And my sister, who's a scientist, reminded me not long ago, as I was railing about language, you know, the terminology of the business world, the terminology of, of the tech world. And, and I, you know, I've been up to here in both of those for 35 years. And um, it makes me insane um, that somebody's going to invent another term for uh, a bit of information in a file somewhere, you know, and cloud computing please i mean what can we abstract this anymore and turn this into something else that you just didn't bother to get new language on so that oh that's what you mean oh for pete's sake so i'm going off on one of my typical rants about about these sorts of things living in my certainty that you know there's clear language somewhere and you know usually she'll come along with me i mean you know we're brother and sister we you know we will come along with each other in our various rants. And she just paused and she got me so good. She said, well, you realize that this is what science is all about. Is that the evolution of science is the, is, is the consolidation of lots of experimental terminology. And really the breakthroughs come when we all sort of understand that the terminology can be grouped together. Mm -hmm. but the only way to get there is to have lots of different variations mm -hmm. on the exact same phenomena. Mm -hmm. And because we're all tinkering, mm -hmm. we're all trying to find a new way. Um, 
so that's that's what I that's what I feel like I'm after is you know what's the new what's our version of you know discussing faith and doubt skepticism and and optimism you know um, finding finding the joy and the poetry of the uncertain distressful moment you know and bringing that open mindedness to it and I think that the term you've stumbled upon and and branded for you really goes a long way towards mm -hmm. doing that. And then the physiological piece that I've only, you know, the last few years really come to understand is that, you know, we have this whole nervous system that's rigged for high sensitivity to disruption around us. And that our anxiety uh, is serving us as a warning system, but we never, it never gets turned off. And we're not built for a constant anxiety. Mm. We're built for periodic anxiety and periodic alertness. But for the most part, when we can relax that vagus nerve system, the polyvagal system, then, then we can inhabit that space of um, being able to explore and the creative piece of all that. And so I, I'm really feeling like we're circling around the same kinds of, of, uh, searching because, because living really well for me, having those great moments is being able to breathe in the middle of the distress. Yeah. And understand, well, this is a really curious experience. This is a curious moment. And stepping back and then things calm down and then other parts of my brain can come online and I can see things. I can go to the frou-frou side of the world as the, as, uh, 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 what was her, Bolte Taylor talked about during her, um, stroke episode. Yeah. And, uh, that's, that's living, you know, it has nothing to do with the, the zeros at the end of the bank account. <laughs> Precisely. We've just come through four years of people with all kinds of money, just crazy, not okay people. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, and then we kind of come back to that, also that thing about how do you find in you, for you, which of the fields, which of the gardens are worth well, tending, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Right. And so in my case, I've had a few decades to be able to catalog what is it that I come around to again and again. And the things that I come to again and again, am I coming to them as sort of an erotic, you know, to use the ancient psychology language, you know, the, the stuff that's mildly self-destructive at this stage but that if I really get far into it, it's, it's, it's destructive, not constructive. Um, and, you know, the, the beauty of, of writing the story about why I'm doing my own plumbing was to, to discover that making, working with my hands, whether it's making drawings or I'm building something, mm -hmm. um, is one of those gardens for me. Mm -hmm. And will always has has been persistent, and so I get to say you know this certainty kind of thing like you know it, it will always, always will be. be yeah right right I was yeah. about to say exactly that and yeah. and it's 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 strange but I I do find it time and again. Um, in in my own case, travel is another one that uh, is 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 part of that for me. Because I feel there's a, there's a certain collection of experiences that I have when I'm traveling that are, be, are very reliable, that I enjoy inhabiting, and um, matters to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a, a question worth pondering for people. I think so, and I think that... Um, I think one of the things that would be useful is to 
you know, be able to develop uh, ways of inquiring of of myself. What does the what do these gardens look like? How do I know them when I'm there? And so questions like, what's the thing you're most afraid to do? Is one of those moments of inquiry. And my mother had a, a um, she was a writer by trade, and and she had a she had a very figurative version of this, which is, um, beware your dragons, they guard your greatest treasures. I love that one. Yeah. And it was her way of saying, uh, or one of her many ways of saying that, pay attention to what your fears have to say. Because beyond what the fears are projecting, on the other side of that, they're guarding something. Mm. You know? And whatever it is that they're guarding is probably a garden. Mm. It may not be, but it's worth looking at, mm. you know. And the kinds of fears we're talking about here are things like, you know, not the, I forget what the term was, but the, not the commonplace fear of, you know, I, I have a fear of stepping in front of a bus, you know. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a basic survival fear. But more of the conceptual fears, more of the things that keep you up at night um, that don't have to do with drinking too much coffee. Um, <laughs> That's easy for me. I don't drink coffee. I've never grown uh, up well, enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'll bet there's something else you do periodically that just keeps you up at night. When you, maybe an ice cream or, you know. Now and again. Uh, now, exactly. and again. now and again if, if nothing along. else <laughs> reading books well uh, right exactly <laughs> can do that for me most definitely right right um, right i can't go to bed yet i'm not at the end of this book <laughs> i've um, had many an all-nighter on account of that yeah i can tell you yeah uh, yeah um well, what's it's a it's it's one of the best ways to explore. Yeah. It, you know. Precisely, I was speaking to yeah. Caspian about that a couple of years ago about about books, and he was asking me, you know, what's what is it with you and books? And that was just <laughs> it, you know, because I read, um, and I said, you know, it's like it's the best way I know to. Have me go. Where did you go? There you go. It, it, oh yeah, the books. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's like it's the best way I know to to travel. I can yes, live yes. now. I can live in the future. I can live in the past. Yes. I can live in different yes. worlds. I can be a, a a young girl, an Egyptian princess. I can be Genghis Khan. I can be a Scottish Highlander. You know, it's like I can I can be anything yeah. that I cannot be as Helena Roth living here 2021. You know, it's like yeah. it's impossible for me to be a Scottish Highlander in the, you know, 1600s. It's just not happening. Right, 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 right. So and I all, love that. I love yeah. how I am able to travel and step into the worlds of so many other people and they become a part of me. Um, and, and I love it. Yeah. Well, and all of the tra uh, of all the travels I've done, the ones that the experiences that I have the mo that are the most rich are the ones where I have read about something that happens in that place. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and that 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 changes the character of the experience dramatically. Mm. Mm. And so being able to inhabit all those times and spaces the gift that i get from somebody writing this is a garden for me mm. that 
story skills opened. I, 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 I write constantly. There is the, there's the business writing and, and all the stuff that goes along with that. And I, I write letters to friends. Um, but I am constantly journaling. And so I, you know, this is, this is a practice that comes from, from recovery as well. But, um, the exploration of spending two pages detailing the temperature of the air on my skin, the smell, the way the light moves across a window is fascinating to me. And it's one of those things where it's one of those 10 or 12 projects that I want to be working on all the time that, that, that sits around me. And they're crying for my, those, those projects are crying for my attention. And they're all potential gardens. Mm -hmm. But there was something that happened in Story Skills that said, yes, it's not that I enjoy writing, but I identify as a writer just as much as I identify as a musician and as a maker and as an, as an artist. Most of the people who know me say he's an architect because mm -hmm. that's my registration. That's, that's, that's my official title mm -hmm. and my official job. Um, but my soul is in, is in this, in that, in that sharing. And as I wrote a few times in, in the notes back and forth to people in story skills, the, you know, people will see me coming and they're like, great, I'm very excited to see Frank, but I don't have three hours. <laughs> And so it's like, just as a so public bye. service route. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, wait a minute. She only scheduled two hours on this, on this uh, Zoom call. I'm not sure it's going to be enough. <laughs> um, but I, you know, as a public service to, to my friends and family, I ought to write more, I think, <laughs> because I've got so much to say. And I, and I, and, and I don't know why that is, uh, I've had a couple people come along and make um, connections to ego around writing, to which I just have this very strong reaction. It's Tell like, me more. You know, what? Uh, somebody said, I'm trying to remember the person so I can I have a little more fidelity in the in the recounting, but it was it was like you had to have a really strong, or or you had to be really egotistical. You had to think a lot of yourself to write a book, to think that you were, um, you were all that, that you could write this book on some subject. Hmm. And my pushback on all that was, no, um, it's that, it's that there is a topic which you are exploring. There is something, there is something of great interest that just requires an enormous amount of words, sentences, paragraphs, chapters to look at the angles of it mm -hmm. and to look at the experience of it and to see how it, to see how it works. Uh, there is a, and that's not necessarily a function of ego. That's a function of curiosity. Sure. People with strong egos write books and, you know, do all kinds of things for attention, but that's not what we're talking about. No, and and it's, you know, it's like my writing. Um, yeah, I'm kind of like you. I've, I've written for work for the past 25 years, but, yeah. but I haven't written for me uh, yeah. all of that time. I started that basically when I started blogging in, in the fall of 20. 12 so really getting into it 2013 when everything happened um i write to discover me as i write i find out who i am what i think what i don't think what i believe what i don't believe yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah, and and you yeah. know it's like that stuff that i've hidden away i find the dragons now and again i go beyond the dragons you know it's like yeah. That's what I do when I write, or that's the potential of my writing. Not every piece I've written is that, right. but but a majority, yes. And and having then now 
um, put out Doing Gentle with an Edge as an ebook mm-hmm. and an audio book, which is a series of blog posts from 2016. It's like, that's not my ego. Sp- I don't perceive it to be my ego speaking, saying, mm-hmm. yay, I'm all this. I know how it's done. You know, it's rather, shit, this really helped me. This is one of the ways that I learned how to do gentle with myself. That might be of value to someone else. Yes, it's available in blog form. Not everybody will find those blog posts. What if, you know, here's another way to generously tell the world, here I made this. Um, and, And looking at my you know, 2,500 blog posts. Um, There's other themes that can be mined and and turned into eBooks or stuff from from that, you know, there's plenty of dragons there. And and I think that's one of the, that's also one of the gifts of reading books for me is that I don't, necessarily like when people tell me what I have to do, but mm-hmm. hearing from others what they have done yeah, can get yeah. me thinking, can get me started, can th- make me think, That's right. maybe I can do something not like that, but that little piece I can incorporate and try on for size. Um, right, right, right. And that's, and that's how we get out of the muck. That's how we get yes, out of our own yes. heads. Is 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 that we are going through and trying to understand, um, you know, just some new angle. Just yes. I need light on this yes. problem yes. because yes. whatever it is that I'm chewing on and is it's disabling me. Yeah. You know, each one of those dragons that I will not, you know, and there's always a pair of them, and the there's a great parable about um, uh, the 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 shield of Isolde. Um, who uh, the parents of Parsifal, Parsifal's um, crest, family crest, is a pair of lions or a pair of dragons. And uh, the symbology was that the only way to deal with that is to go straight through. Hmm. You know, so you walk right between those dragons and you, you know, you find out they're just puppy dogs who just want to roll around on their backs and play. They're lonely. That's why they're grumpy. Uh, It's like, oh, uh, okay. All right. uh, Yeah, that's me. And, um, and in the offering of that, that's a new idea that somebody else in the audience may have, may have be having that struggle and they're, they're not going to pick up my path, but what they are going to do is they're going to go, Oh, I wonder if, as you pointed out, precisely. And so now I just offered somebody anonymously, randomly, um, in their ether, you know, and it appears to come from the heavens, you know? To our to our minds, that's that's what it is. We can we can do attributions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, and this is what happens in recovery. You know that that that's that, that's that's the reason for the meeting. You know, as you come together and you know thirty people in a room and and they don't know each other. They're not, um, you know, they're not breaking bread every every day. They're they're not living in the same same home. But but it, we're we're strangers to each other and. The, the task is to spend a couple of minutes sharing what's the deep, dark thing that's eating you alive today. Mm-hmm. And that's being, that's being vulnerable. That's giving voice to that fear that's really got you that day. And in and of itself, that is the service. Just speaking your, giving voice to your troubles is a service to others and it's not egocentric it is not um it, it it is giving it is generous it is being willing to be embarrassed it is being willing to admit to another person that i can't consume control my consumption around something or it is being willing to admit to another person that today the some driver somewhere um angered me when it was never personal, it was, you know, and, and I'm risking showing a certain lack of character, right? 
all of this is made up. And I'm such a victim of like some narratives from outside that I'm applying to myself. It's not even that somebody else is putting it on me. It's that I'm putting it on me, you know. Precisely. Um, and I, I think we're, we're just, uh, I'm so grateful for, for us having this ability to reach out and find each other in this way. Um, to be able to talk about these things because to be left alone with these kinds of issues and these kinds of thoughts is terrifying. Yeah. You just get deeper into that muck. You're yeah. just spinning the wheels and it's just going further down and further down and further yeah, down. Yeah, and it is quicksand. Yeah. And you will drown in it. Mm. Um. So I, you know, to. I mean, it's it's uh, it's life saving in many ways, and I don't mm -hmm. mean to be over dramatic about it. I, but it, it it's a statement of fact. I've seen it so many times. People walk in, and they start talking about, you know, uh, the fact that the dog next door barks all the time, and it makes them crazy, and because they because they you know it comes out over time. As they as they share this over the year, or whatever year that was, that they that they feel like they're supposed to know what to do, and that's the real thought that's just eating them up. It's not the dog; it's that they feel like they're supposed to be. They should be. Yeah. And I've learned over time to listen to listen to wherever in my narrative or in somebody else's narrative, should comes up. That's a point of shame. It's not necessarily a garden, but it's a point of shame. Yeah. And it's a place to pay attention. Yeah, I've been, I've, I've, I'm quite aware of when I'm shooting myself. Um, <laughs> right, that's the phrasing. Um, my son's headed off for the gym. Um, it's, it's when I start to think, and I mean, here we go circling back again to the importance of language. Yes. Right. I, right. I got onto this a long time ago about the use of the words right and wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to be very, if I use those words, I really know that's what I want to use. Good. I try to be very particular about if I say I must. Uh, you know, it's like, well, maybe I want to. Must, not so much. There's really not yeah. that many musts. Um, right. Should is one thing. Now I've, like with deadline, I'm, I'm, I'm getting more aware of where language is violent. Hmm. You know, we speak a lot about fighting. We speak a lot about bullets. You know, it's like I have my bullet journal. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like. I never saw that coming. How yeah, right, is, is right. that so, so wise? It's like there's, right. you know, you, you, you shoot a, you, you know, you shoot a picture. Shoot a yeah. yeah, it's like, yeah. it's like. Okay, how can I, so I'm, I'm right now on the lookout for words that somehow stem from violence, from warring, from fighting, from, uh, I wonder, yeah, I, I'm making other, you know, making somebody else an other. Mm -hmm. This is the, um, because that's the first act of war. Hmm. Um, yeah, and there's the thing. Um, there's there's two that 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 long standing long arc wisdom around. Every generation has to tell its stories in its language. So we are. We have that. We have that uh, time coming to us as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fascinated by that. Hmm. To for for you to be listening for those things and trying to find 
new ways to express them. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, uh, I'll be curious to uh, continue to exchange information about what we come up with uh, as a replacement yeah. for deadline. Yeah, it, you know, because it's like, what's there? Opening. Uh, you know, interesting. The, the, uh, uh, in architecture, uh, particularly if you're working in retail architecture, what you're working towards in your project is a grand opening. Mm-hmm. Is the mm-hmm. sort of more elaborate way that the marketing will will go about it, but um, it could be it could be a little more grounded, a little more mm-hmm. close to close to home, and just say that's the opening. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, and draw our attention to what happens beyond. Mm-hmm. And then we get our movement. Yeah? Precisely. And um, but, but you know, I mean, it's, it's also, I've been... Um, this thing that you can't make me angry, but you can say something really shitty that I get angry about, yeah. right? You yeah. can't make me angry. You can try best you want. It requires me to think, hey, he shouldn't say that to me for me to become angry, right? Yeah, good. But our language, we every we say this about everything and everyone. You make me happy, you make me whole, you make me angry, you make me be you right. make me want to be a better person, you make you make me, you make me, you make me. No. I become angry when you. I yes. feel yes. whole when I'm with yes. you. Completely yes. different thing. Because again, different. with that agency and power, I retain yes. it. That's right. That's right. That's right. And you and and you can go further, and you can say things like, um, "When we're in this place, I am willing to. I'm willing to share myself, yeah. or I am unwilling. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And and even in the phrasing, I am, is 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 tricky too. We've mm-hmm. been working here around um, the bullying language. We don't say mm-hmm. that that uh, you are a bully. No. You know, we say that that's bullying behavior. Precisely. And we're we're attuned to that now, mm. and and trying to work that in. So I think that 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 too is. Yeah, when it comes to bullying, but you are angry. Yes, correct. I'm, no, you're uh, you're comes, expressing I, angry behavior, right? So he's like. That's right. That's it, right. It, if you that's if right. you extrapolate it from the one specific situation, we might have been sort of the starting point for it. Okay. But I mean, I got so frustrated a couple of years ago when I really started to think about, you know, I get angry when you say this and that. I make myself Mm -hmm. angry because I want it to be something else than what you're saying, etc. Look at at, at lyrics, song lyrics. (laughs) (laughs) It is rife. With this stuff, you make me it really is. is it must be one of the most common oh, phrases wow. in in yeah. song lyrics. Yeah, yeah. Talk about a word cloud. I mean, what a, what an interesting word cloud that would be, right? To yeah. try to find. Yeah. Yeah. What are the most common phrases? Yeah. You know, don't 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 confine it to a single word. Confine it to you know a phrase. A phrase. Yeah. That you know, and which ones become really big, and the, yeah, yeah, you're right. That's the yeah. stuff that inhabits the imagination, yeah. and I want the yeah. stuff behind the scenes that says, because I don't want to say that um, I feel angry. I want to move be. I want to move farther upstream from that, and I want to say that frightens me. Yeah, that hurts. Yeah, um, that's isolating. Um. That and makes me move. feel really small. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Right. Right. Because that's the more that I get closer to those things, mm-hmm. the more I can feel the release mm. and the connection. And and I can feel the I can feel the um you know, I'm onto something if I can feel the tears coming. Mm-hmm. 
and that is where the release is. That's where the that's where the catharsis is. That's where the that's where I stop being owned by, you know, my mm-hmm. reactions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can I can I can be that person who's you know underneath the pipe with the water running all over me and holding the saw and being in heaven about it. Mm-hmm. Um, So yeah, keep that going. Keep mm-hmm. keep that going. I, I I I I at one time wanted to build a sort of um, mind map of the word fear and the word love because sometimes those are those are put in, in opposition. Yeah, that that they are, and there's all all sorts of fun semantic things that can happen around. Well, what's the opposite of fear? And you know, is it faith? Is it you know? And it's curious that fear is is a belief. Mm-hmm. You know, it is a it is a it is a, it is a question of it is a form of trust. You know, obviously this person says this about me. My fear says that it's true, mm-hmm. and takes it as true when I actually I don't know. You know, um, but I wanted to make this I wanted to make this this uh, decision tree or this this mind map from all the different ways that fear gets expressed and just start building out that vocabulary and see how far it can go and then inhabit those other things, you know, and start to use them as a way to both look for the poetry in the day, you know, but also to help me in my awareness. This is another thing that's making me a little nuts about, you know, the the self-awareness is is everywhere in but there's there's not a whole lot of it's not that i am i'm railing about self-awareness it's that if if you're going to encourage people to be self-aware you want to give them a toolbox that they can draw from so that they can actually do something with self-awareness because you know it makes sense to me that you wouldn't want to be self-aware about something that you're pretty sure if you bring it up you're going to be isolated and alone so i wouldn't blame you for sitting on that one and not sharing it Precisely. Um, and and, you know, and and one of my favorite words is discernment. Yes. Which speaks to just that for me. It's like yeah. the self-awareness is a starting point for many a things, but it needs to be dealt with with discernment. What right. do I do with this? Right. What's right. in this for me to find out, <laughs> to discover more, to act upon, to not act upon, you know. Um, What's the opening? And, and, and this is one of my pet peeves is, is kind of in this, in this area or this, this time of of self awareness of aware people of of open people of you know enlightened people is how close minded you can become in that if yeah. you don't kind of zoom out now and again you know, yeah. yes, really good to be yeah. self-aware for you, and you need yeah, this. But there's other people around you too, you know? It's like yeah. the ability to zoom in and zoom out of that is so important. And then yeah. I can use yeah. my needs, my wants, my desires, etc., with discernment, you know? It's like, is is this appropriate here or not? I need this. Okay. But right now, right here, not appropriate. Okay. I'll leave. I'll say bye. I have to go. You know, take action by all means. But don't expose everybody else to what your needs is if it's actually not of benefit to the greater good of of the all. Yeah. There's Uh, the skill of being merciful. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, to not, and to be aware of your audience. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's 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 another that's another way to you know that 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 discernment yeah. leads leads yeah. is, yeah. you know, now that I know these things, what am I supposed to do with them? Yeah. And 
that journey is is very difficult too, and there's not a lot of language around it. No, you know, and it, and it, it would take in many time. ways, I think there's a lot more ego there than yeah. what I feel I think amongst right. writers wanting to write a book or feeling that here's a book. Well, absolutely. Yeah. A- a- absolutely. That's and that was something else that, that people would joke about was, you know, there's there's nothing worse than a self-righteous reformed smoker. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, great. Great. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Let me guess. You're going to tell me how bad smoking is and then how lovely you feel that you're not smoking anymore. Yeah. You know, and it's like. Yeah. Okay. Ten times out of ten. Yes. Ten times out of ten. <laughs> and uh, and I think that. Uh, um, and, and that's and that's the other thing that I really really appreciated about uh, about story skills in particular, but the akimbo community in general, is that it's not a question of are you generous. It's not a question of do you have something to say or something to do, but being specific about what that is and 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 making the effort to discover who your audience is and to really go and approach them and to talk to them and to listen to their voice and to listen to their need and to bring to bring that into my thinking to bring that into my intentionality um i'm very enthusiastic about a a, a handful of of things. I'm a drummer and I love drumming and I really have so much fun about that. But I'm very careful about who I talk to about that. Mm. Because not everybody is. Mm. And I I'm not the kind of drummer who is uh, like Leonard Bernstein was with with um with the children around classical music where he would invite them in and there was this whole, you know, 20 minute spot of Leonard Bernstein talking to kids about music. And Maybe that's in my future, but I'm not there yet. I'm still quite in the sort of nerd phase and enjoying, you know, how much I understand about it and how much I want to share that, um, but also very much learning. So I'm careful with that. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, there are relationships that I have where I I get sort of off the off track with the context is in in recovery it's a fair bet that i can spend 20 minutes with somebody after a meeting and talk about you know issues of spirituality issues of shortcomings and the difficulties with you know these sorts of things and you know that's going to go fairly well but if i take that to the thanksgiving dinner table or to the christmas dinner table I'm going to have a different experience and I need to understand that. And I need to know that, that that's, that that's actually a thing Mm. and I need to pay attention because, um, uh, for a variety of reasons, people are at different places with these subjects and I need to find a way to get good at finding out where people are with these things. Again, discernment. Discernment. Yeah. 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 So tell me, tell me a little bit more about that term for you and, and the scope of it and uh, sort of its practical places for you. So I have been the best judger, you know. <laughs> I, judgment, I was number one. Okay. And I didn't judge anybody harder than I judged myself. Okay. So... I have worked a lot with coming up with other ways of speaking about about myself, about what the inner judge can tell me about myself and 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 you know really working at working with finding when I judge uh, noticing what I judge, you know, what's behind that and what's behind that and what's behind that to come to those. And then a couple of years ago, I wonder if it was Krista Tippett who spoke something about discernment. And I just went, bam! 
<laughs> right? Because again, it's not judging right or wrong. It's discerning this is appropriate right now. Yeah. And I just went, that's the word I've been trying to find as yeah. I've been trying to step away from, from judgment. Because uh, right. I know how, how, like, the negative effects of me judging myself harshly have been huge. Yeah. You know, it comes at a cost. So, one, yeah. I don't want to judge myself. Two, why would I then judge anybody else? Right. Right? I don't want right. to do that either. And now and again. So he's like, you know, I was like, it was wobbly ground there because sometimes it's like, well, I want to judge this, but I don't want to be the judge, right? <laughs> so then discernment kind of comes as this, you know, maybe it's a, a, a next door neighbor to judgment mm -hmm. that just feels like there's wisdom there. There's... There's um, greater perspective there. Uh, it's the gray scales, whereas the judgment more is the black or white, right or wrong. Um, right. So. Right, the shoulds. The shoulds, precisely. You should do this. Yeah. Whereas yeah. with discernment, it's rather, you know, have you tried this? Or, oh, no, that won't work for me today. I'm really happy it works for you. You know. Right. Um, right. Right. Yeah, and judgment is is um, judgment is the power to validate my existence or not, and judgment is useful for me when you know I'm trying to make a decision about. You know, am I done with something? Am I complete with a, a task? Um, um, is this going to, you know, we're using, this is the other trouble I have with the word judgment. Because I know what you're talking about. You're talking about, you know, the the, the kind of existential, yep. you know, yep. legitimacy yep. of things versus uh, should I be eating this or should I be eating that? Um, should I be painting this or not? Kind of kind of thing which we do all the time so I'm very open to another word because we we talk about making judgment calls all the yeah. time and yeah. I think that that's a that's a very useful phrase yeah. and and gets us far down the road uh, so what I'm trying to understand is you know is something that you're proposing in your language or your actions or your behavior um, something that I can abide by and can I can I go along with this uh, at this time? And the answer may be no. And I think one of the things that happens with me is that I get a little I get a little anxious about whether or not I can say no to something. And again, it's back to this this question of consumption. You know, there's a there's doubt in my mind about um, my ability to control my consumption. There's doubt in my mind about my ability to say no. You know, knowing that something isn't going to work for me today at this time, will I say so? And sometimes I won't. And I'll find myself in that spot where, you know, somebody used to say that, uh, that um, before you can get angry, first you have to get into position. You know? um, and that's that move. You know, understanding my boundaries is the is, is is sort of the conventional terminology that that's the way I see much of this is is it's a question about um, what do I find it what do I find that will work for me and what won't work for me and that acknowledges that uh, this is a journey this is not a static thing that today I can tolerate X Y and Z but tomorrow I might not be able to tolerate it. Um, in part, you know, it could be something, it could be something as, as, um, 
I, I've never been able to eat fish, not because I have any physical reaction to it. It's just it doesn't hit my palate. I, I don't seem to have the receptors in my taste buds for it. So, um, uh, but it could be that tomorrow uh, that might change. And so, you know, that's that's one way to be discerning. But the, you know, another, th another thing is I have a, one of, one of my clients is uh, very type A and um, he's a riot. And uh, there are days, and one of the things that happens is that that uh, he will he has the power to shut down a room in a heartbeat. And he, because uh, he uses big voice, you know, he'll just come in and use his big voice. And people, people retreat. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful to be in a place where I'm like, I'm more than happy to call him out and to stop him when... You know, he's making, a, he's making a judgment call based on the incomplete information. And I happen to know that if he had the rest of the information that I was about to give him, but he interrupted me, right, that he'd make a different decision. He might not, but he has more information available than he's going on. And so I give it to him. And that's a boundary for me, is that if I have a complete story, then, and I'm called to to participate in some major decision, I'm going to advocate to make sure that that information is out on the table for everyone to work with. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's for me, one of the things that I've, I've noticed in me, um, which also one of my, one of my oldest friends, I've been friends with her since fifth grade. Um, she gave me the best compliment a couple of years ago. She said, Helena, you used to be so black and white. Now you can see, <laughs> you know, now you can see all sides and you just, you know, it's yes, like yes. you don't judge yes. it. So good in, in areas of like what, what might easily turn into gossip. Yes. Right. I mean, I, I, really try my best to stay out of drama because it bores me, Absolutely. but, but Absolutely. in that thing, you know, Somebody has has cheated on his wife or a girlfriend and then oops something happened or whatever it's like it's so easy for people to judge there and it was yeah. easy for me to judge there yeah i i really try not to do that not because i condone bad behavior not because mm -hmm. I think it was right for that wife to be cheated on, not because any of those things, but just because, like you said with your friend, there's more, there's more facts to be known That's than right. just what's visible on the surface. That's right. Um, That's right. That's right. And discernment for me in that situation is around understanding that, that sometimes, sometimes there's being frightened by the presence of that of that event so close to home you know and you know maybe maybe if i'm engaged in some sort of discussion about other people's behavior like that um maybe i feel like i don't know that i could handle that and so this is my defense you know i know what i would do you know and I'd really rather not talk about it any further. Thank you very much. And so I just want to put that out there. That's where it is. And I'm really big about it. You know, but the truth is, yes, there's there's doubt back there. Mm. You know, and it can be frightening to hear that, yeah, there's mitigating circumstances. There's, mm. there's other things happening there. Yeah. Because it's a lot to take on. Yeah. And we're back to... We're back to denial is the shock absorber of the soul. Sometimes those dragons are there with those fears because, you know, what's in that garden is so precious that, um, you know, the, the bigger the fear, you know, the, the more precious it is. And the issue as a human being is, and that I also really loved about the art of possibility that was unpacked marvelously, was that, um, and this is also true, you find this in, in the recovery communities too, is, is there was a time when those dragons and that guarding was really seriously necessary. It was important for survival. It wasn't, it wasn't about 
it wasn't about, oh, I just, you know, I don't want to talk about it too much. You're a little shy. You're a little embarrassed. No, it was existentially required to be guarded. But as we grow, Precisely. Um, we must we must go tend those gardens. Yeah. Precisely. Because they are, they're not only generative in that kind of interesting, I'd like to take up painting kind of way. They're generative as in, I have the will to live. <laughs> because this isn't really... There, there's lines in here about about um, the will to live, and we can. There are things that we can tolerate. We can tolerate a great many things for short periods of time, but tending our gardens isn't something that you can just leave be. You know, you've got to go do that eventually, or we lose the will to live. Mm-hmm. And this is the this is the thing about captivity. You know, whether it's the captivity of the mind or actual physical captivity is, yep. you know, and and my real agency and my real energy and my real enthusiasm. And again, that's why I'm that's why I'm excited about it. That's why I am interested in it. That's that's what's there um, is what lights you up, you know, and. I want to be in a space where what lights me up has place. And if it doesn't, then that, that, that becomes problematic. And that's, that's something that needs to be addressed. So, you know. That's the, and that's probably a lot of what I'm, I'm trying to understand in my, uh, in my work. Mm. Is... And, and again, I think one of the one of the great leaps of faith in 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 my work going forward, coming out of both story skills and alt MBA, is that I have a great deal of enthusiasm for the two lines of story that I'm working on right now. And um, to have presented those things to those communities and gotten. Frankly, very unexpected feedback. I, I had no idea that I had no idea that that me talking about uh, any of the stories that I wrote in Story Skills would be of interest, or get the kinds of responses that I got. I, I just never saw that coming. Um, I, I I had hoped to get up, you know, a few tips and tricks like you get with Photoshop, or like you get with, you know, cleaning a clog out of a drain or something like that, you know. Um, but to have actual genuine interest from people, that was, yeah. that was unexpected. Yeah, and it's quite amazing. Yeah, yeah. It is. And, um, and I, think, I think part of what's happened with me for Alt-MBA is, is uh, when I came out of story skills, I was very worried about community. You know, where would we... Where, you know, I understood this relationship with you guys and that, you know, I needed to find a way to get that going. And, and while we were in workshop, we had a structure, you know, we had Avraham back there with, you know, running discourse for us, you know, and we could, we would have this place to gather. And with Forward Link, we have this place to gather, but there's this intentionality we have to bring. We have to self-organize to make it happen. How many people are out there and graduates of Akimbo who are not participating at the level that we're participating. <laughs> and so, um, uh, that's, that's the vitality mm-hmm. Precisely. of, uh, uh, of this. And I, I feel very strongly that, that it is something that I am, it is a huge challenge for me because I am not an initiator in relationship. Um, And I've gotten a lot, a lot better at that. But that was something that I discovered early in my recovery, early in my adulthood. And that, you know, I've done a lot of work around that. And I, I am much better at it, but it still requires, I have to be attentive to it. To it, yeah. Uh, because I, I, uh, I, I, I get, I get, um, I do get preoccupied and at times quite self-absorbed. And, uh, the best thing that's happened to me around all of that is that I've scheduled regular calls with people, mm. you know, 
I, I try not to leave a conversation without saying, so when are we talking again? Yeah. You know, because I know that if I, if I don't do that, I'm kind of screwed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, these conversations, this type of conversation is so one of my gardens too. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's no question. Yeah. There's no question. You know, there's I, lots of words for, for it, but it, I like being in the space of it. Yeah. Just being in the space of it, whatever it's described as. Yeah. You know. Um, and And I can look at my life and, you know, again, I had a coach client... That has to be like six years ago by now, or possibly even seven. We'd gone for a coach walk, uh, and we came back, and he said, wow, another great, you know, session. And he said, I don't have this type of, of conversation with anybody but you. And I went, huh, I do. I have this type of conversation almost on a daily basis. But five years ago, back then, I basically didn't have any. Yes. So I have been a part of making this happen in my life. Nobody else can build That's right. my dream life but me. So I told, That's right. I told him that, and I told him, you make sure you have this type of conversation with others. Find them. Find them. You know, find them. Reach out ahead yeah. and say, hey, I'm interested in this. You want to talk? Because <laughs> um, it's yeah, so, it's so a, vital. Yeah. And it's a, it's, it's a major blessing. Yeah. You know, to be able to conduct this kind of a conversation. Yeah. And, you know, we have had, we've had several. And I look forward to many more, yeah. you know. Yeah. So on that note, let's wrap. We'll set up a time outside of this. Um, thank you, Frank, for talking to me today, for being here in this space together. What a pleasure. It's such a gift. Thank you for asking. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing how it comes out. Yeah, we'll see. So, Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Bye. You make a great weekend.